joining us now. Vivek Ramaswamy also has his brand new book that is being released today. Uh, it is called Truths, The Future of America First. Vivek, I saw you out in L.A. a couple weeks ago, so I hope everything yep. has been going well. I understand you're in New York right now. Uh, what should people know about the – well, we'll get to the book in a sec – what do you think is the status of the election based on everything you're seeing six weeks out officially from Election Day? How would you analyze the respective horse race here? So, look, I think it, for the horse race part of this, I would say it's dead heat at uh, the presidential level. I'd give President Trump the advantage. And frankly, if I'm calling it like I see it, I think we're at a disadvantage in the Senate races in critical states. So I could really foresee a scenario where President Trump is successfully elected without a clear majority for Republicans in the Senate. That's the way things are trending, but a lot could change in October. Now, my warning call, and this is also part of why I wrote this book, actually, I intended its publication date right now, ahead of the election, as a warning call, that we were warned of a red wave that we were going to have in 2022. Well, it never came. And I think we're at risk of something similar happening in 2024, unless we level up and actually articulate not just the policies that we're against from the other side, but a strong vision of what we actually stand for. And if we do that, I think that this could actually, the tide could turn both the presidential level and the Senate in our direction in a big way. And that's a big part of the call to action, the lighting the fire under our feet that I hoped to achieve with this book. You know, Vivek, we uh, asked some undecided voters to join us in the first hour to call in and tell us what was uh, on their list of concerns, and, and a big discussion about health care was started as a result of that, which is not something that the media has been very focused on, nor, honestly, either campaign. Um, and, and I'm wondering, if you were to try to articulate what is, and, and I know you have a background in pharmaceuticals, uh, if you were to articulate what an America First health care program looks like, what does it sound like? I mean, what, what, what should President Trump pursue yeah. and what can he do? So one of the dirty little secrets is that actually one of the top focuses of HHS, Health and Human Services, is actually on the illegal mass migration crisis. Not a lot of people appreciate that. That's actually one of the most important functions because a lot of those illegals are routed into HHS pursuant to a lot of these and a lot of not only the amnesty programs, but a lot of the migrant care programs. So I think the first thing we've got to do is make HHS will liberate, solve the immigration crisis, that actually puts HHS back in its mission of making America and Americans the healthiest country on the planet. That actually has not been part of the job of an HHS bureau before. It's really been the job of kind of a health accountant. Instead of actually being ambitious about making the country as healthy as we possibly can be at a moment where we've been in life expectancy increases for a very long time, we're seeing that trend turn against us. You're right, it hasn't been a major issue for either candidate in this race, and I think it's because some of the areas where you'd have to stake out a policy claim could be controversial. I mean, what do you do with the continued funding of Medicare? Medicare versus Medicare Advantage. Now, that's, that's a, you know, gets into some technical details we probably don't want to go into, but Medicare Advantage is one where people are able to choose private health insurance plans offered by Medicare versus centralized Medicare, which has far less options and far poorer outcomes. And this is something that, you know, I think we ought to focus on after the election. It's not a top question that I think is going to move voters just because it requires so much education between now and election day. But the more we're talking about improving the health of Americans, the more we can also say we have the bandwidth to do it once HHS is not occupied with dealing with the effects of the mass illegal immigration crisis in the country. And I do think President Trump has been outstanding in repeatedly bringing attention to that issue in a way that wouldn't have been the case is if you know a different person were running. You're in Ohio. Uh, Midwest is going to decide this race, probably. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. How would you handicap the Midwest based on what you're seeing, and how over the next six weeks do you think the closing argument should and will be played out across those Midwest battlegrounds? So I'll give you where I'm drawing my pulse from. I went to the University of Pittsburgh last week, spoke to a bunch of college students in Pennsylvania that are Pennsylvania voters. I did a town hall in Springfield, Ohio, not far from where I live. We uh, sent out a social media post. I expected some number of people to show up. Turns out some order of 2,000 people RSVP'd. 
and several hundred packed a room that day and really got a pulse for the town. And I'm headed to Wisconsin to, to do a rally myself tomorrow. And so I'm, I've got a finger on the pulse. And something you can't get from the polling is just the energy, the sixth sense for the energy you get on the ground. I think Donald Trump has a major advantage in those Midwestern states where people really have seen prices go up at a steeply faster rate than their wages. And I think that that fact just is a backdrop fact that works deeply in President Trump's favor. It doesn't matter the rhetoric. It doesn't matter what people might have as fringe policy disagreements. When their prices have gone up faster than their wages have, that creates a level of discontent. And 2019 wasn't that long ago that they remember what it felt like back then as well. I think the effects of the border crisis have now spilled into not just Texas and Arizona, but are now spilling into the Midwest, too. That's relatively more recent, the effects of mass illegal migration being so palpable for people in Michigan and in Ohio and even in states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. And so I do think that those factors point pretty favorably for President Trump in those states. You do have Senate candidates in multiple of those states that are still trailing their Democratic competitors. And so what that says is people are being pretty thoughtful. That should give us more confidence in President Trump's numbers because they're saying that, okay, I'm not sure about the Senate candidates in these respective states, but I do remember what those four years like were like under Donald Trump, and that's why I'm still voting for Donald Trump, even if I'm less certain of who I'm voting for for U.S. Senate, which gives me more confidence in that. We're speaking to Vivek Ramaswamy. His new book out today, Truths, the Future of America First. And, and Vivek, to that end, uh, let's just say you were a senior advisor in the next Trump White House. I'm very confident Trump's going to win, but I know people yell at me and say, stop, stop, you know, jinxing it or whatever. But I think that this time around, um, we're looking good. Anyway, let's say you're a senior advisor and are able to help um, shape what is at the top of the agenda for America first. And it really would have to be in the first two years of his presidency. Cause as we know, he's only got one more term. What is it? What are the, what are the top issue so, one or two, uh, one or two issues uh, that you would say, Mr. President, we got to get on this and we got to make big strides on it. So I'll make it succinct. And both of these are at the heart of my new book that's out today. Two mass deportations. Okay. One is the mass deportation of millions of illegals who are in this country against the law. But that's insufficient. We also require a second mass deportation of the millions of unelected federal bureaucrats out of Washington, D.C. And I think those two things basically save the country. That's how you save a nation. First is if we have an immigration system that makes sense in the country, where the only people who enter the United States of America are those who benefit the United States of America and do it pursuant to the rule of law. That's solved one of our two major crises in this country. And the second is the fact that the people we elect to run the government, they're not even the ones who actually run the government anymore, change that by firing 75% of the bureaucrats, shutting down agencies that shouldn't exist, rescind unconstitutional federal regulations that are wielded by these lawless three-letter agencies. If we do that, that's the single greatest economic stimulus you could give our economy. But it also gives us a shot in the arm of reviving self-governance and our pride in our country. So this is a common thread through the book. I think probably I have a chapter on the border in the book and about what we could do to fix immigration in a way that hasn't yet been talked about, even by Republicans. But I think the most important part of the book, and I think the most important part of a a governing agenda, would actually be to make sure we have three branches of government in the United States again, not four, and to shut down those three-letter agencies and the four million federal bureaucrats who work there. We don't need 75% of them. And I think if we're able to take that head on early on in the in a second Trump term, that is how you save a republic. That is how you stimulate an economy. And those issues sometimes bore people when you talk about the administrative state or whatever. But one of the things I try to do in this book, and especially probably the most important chapter in the book, is that one on the bureaucratic state, is to make it accessible, to make it actually explain how that's impacting the lives of everyday Americans, such that that's not somebody else's academic concern, but that is the concern and the root cause of the cancer in our country. And so I hope people, you know, who read the book are able to be armed with those arguments in a way that they might not be if they're debating their friends on the left. I want them to come out on the winning side of those debates. And that's why I wrote this book. Uh, Last question for you, Vivek, and we appreciate the time. Good luck with the book. Encourage you guys to go check it out. Um, 
How concerned are you about the censorious media environment in the country today? And that if Kamala Harris wins, what do you think that would do to the marketplace of ideas, whether it's coming down on Elon? We already know the impact that Facebook and other outlets have felt based on their uh, being attacked by, for lack of a better word, the Biden administration. Look, I'm worried about the censorship culture in the modern West, and particularly in the United States of America. What you've had over several years is the government threatening tech companies to censor speech or else face government backlash and why they've become the instruments of state power. You've seen that continue under the Biden administration. Thankfully, some of that has been exposed. Elon buying Twitter was a major milestone, not just for Twitter, but because it put the other companies on notice that they were now at least facing competition in the marketplace of ideas. So am I worried about it? You're darn right I am. But I'm also encouraged by the fact that people in this country have woken up to no longer swallow what they're force-fed. I think we did have a culture of complacency in the country where you didn't see the level of skepticism from ordinary citizens and the public that you do today, seeking information out, not just because MSNBC or CNN told them something that they believe in, but that they have to actually view what they're fed, even by the government, with skepticism. So in some sense, culturally, I'm encouraged, but I think that it is going to be a pro-censorship environment if Kamala Harris is the president, just as it was under Joe Biden. And I think that we can't live through that for too long. And that is, if I had to summarize the thesis of, of truth, the book, in one line, it is that the path to truth runs through free speech and open debate. There's no such thing as an opinion that is rightfully censored. What does free speech mean? I mean, people lose track of this. Does that mean you can threaten somebody? No. Does it mean you can engage in commercial fraud? No. But the easiest way, and I talk about this in in the book as well, easy ways to explain to your friends on the left or on the other side what it actually means. Here I do it in the case of free speech. It means that you get to express any opinion. There's no such thing as a wrong opinion that can't be expressed. It's too wrong to be expressed. That's what America was founded on. And so if we're clear-headed about these things, because they always bring up, well, what about the fraud or what about the hate speech or the threat? Well, hate speech is an opinion. A threat is a threat. Those are two different kinds of speech. And in America, when we say free speech, it means all opinions get to be expressed. And that, too, is, I think, at the heart of saving our country. It's at the heart of my new book, and and I hope that people are able to stand for this ideal of free speech. It's in the First Amendment for a reason. It's one of the most important ideals this country was founded on, and I think it is one of the issues at stake in this election as well. The book is Truths, the Future of America First, Vivek Ramaswamy. Book is out. Check it out in bookstores. Vivek, we appreciate the time. Good luck with the book. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. I want to tell you, as we roll into fall, how many of you out there are starting to put together all of those old summer memories while simultaneously getting ready Hate to put you on the spot. It's only a couple of months till Thanksgiving now. Halloween's not very far away. How many of you had great Halloween costumes? How many of your kids and grandkids have great Halloween costumes over the years? And how many spectacular Thanksgivings and then moving on into Christmases have you spent with your family? Are all those family memories preserved? If they're not, we're not even to October yet, but it's not too soon to think about the best possible Christmas gift you could share with your family. It's to digitize your family memories and get them preserved forever from our friends at Legacy Box. In less than a month, if you send in all those great old family photos, VHS tapes, all of the non-digitized memories you have, you can get them back. And right now, you'll get 50% off the regular prices because they're going to be flooded during the holiday season. And if you get in early, you can save a bundle And imagine if you are the dad, the grandpa, the grandma, the grandma, uh, the uh, grandma, the mom that gets everything taken care of for the holiday season this far out. Think of all the entertainment and future legacy you're providing, and you're also taking care of a holiday season gift early. Legacybox.com slash Clay for half off regular prices. Legacybox.com slash Clay, 55% off half off and more of all their prices right now. Legacy.com.